going to do after you graduate? To the graduating seniors out there, is it just me, or is that question asked as often as, what is your name? When you were younger, you were asked a similar question. It was, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, back then, you could have gotten away with fantastical ambitions like cowboy, astronaut, or creator Doors 2011, or even flower. Well, now, <laughs> now that you're a grown up, people demand an answer. People like the one sitting in the second row at this presentation. They want to know, what are you going to do after you graduate? Well, before you look at the future, first you have to assess the past. Your resume arguably includes information about both. It includes a diploma, a GPA, or a numerical representation of all the knowledge you've accumulated in four years at the university. A laundry list of summer jobs, internships, research, the list goes on. But the most important thing is a major, a major of major importance. The average college student changes their major an average of three times throughout their college career. What does that say for that student who's only changed it twice? I actually never divorced my major in microbiology, even though we did go through a very messy separation at one point in time. <laughs> I felt as if I was being pushed along this process with the sole purpose to graduate, not having, not having time to think about why I was studying this material and what it would entail for my future. Did I really make a career decision that fateful day in orientation freshman year? I began to feel trapped, depressed, that in three semesters left, I had to make a decision about what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So, to combat my quarter-life crisis, I began to have affairs with other majors. <laughs> but as I was exploring potential suitors, I felt like any one of them would just be a rebound, a, someone to settle with, <laughs> not, not a major to spend the rest of my life with. I didn't know what to do, but as I was studying up at the fourth floor of Marston Science Library, <coughs> studying for my exams in microbiology, I began to see metaphors and relationships between things in microbiology and broader concepts, concepts that I could use no matter what I want to do for the rest of my life. The first one I looked at was Le Chatelier's principle. Le Chatelier's is a guide, not a rule, that explains the dynamic equilibrium between products and reactants in a chemical reaction. The fundamental concept is A plus B products turn into C plus D reactants but also that the reverse reaction is simultaneously true. In microbiology, there are thousands of processes, often very difficult to explain. But a metaphor that I like to, to relate it to is coffee. It's part of your morning routine. You add sugar to your coffee in the morning, and that sugar dissolves and becomes soluble. However, let's say you're at Starbucks, and you're adding sugar to your coffee, and that lid falls off the dispenser. Now, what does that say? It says you need to get a new cup of coffee. But it also says that the reverse reaction, the re products and reactants, are, are visible. Even though this is an exaggeration, the same thing happens in your cells. Now, as you can see, I know it's really hard to tell from your point of view, but there are thousands of ways that you can get to a certain product, one product. There's no one way. So, Le Chatelier is, Contest the stigma that if you're studying accounting, you have to become an accountant, art, an artist, or microbiology, a microbiologist. It explains that there's many ways to go about doing one thing. And oftentimes, being an innovator, doing something different, might help you along the way. Which leads me to salmonella. <laughs> salmonella is the leading cause of bacterial fo food poisoning in the United States with an estimated 100,000 illnesses caused in the United States every year. How does it do this? It goes against bacterial conventional wisdom. Now, most bacteria are virulent or able to cause disease by evading the host immune system, not getting caught. Salmonella does the exact opposite. It purposely targets M cells, as you can see, the ones that look different. It targets these cells, which are, are used to sample the food for bacteria. Then they send that same bacteria to a macrophage where they are destroyed. Salmonella finds these M cells, goes to the macrophage, replicates, escapes, and then infects other cells. Its ability to, to innovate has let it become the most successful bacterial pathogen around. Now, one of the most overlooked aspects in microbiology is the history of it, the discoverers. 
it's usually condensed into one or two slides sometime in the beginning of the semester. And it's, it's not very looked into much after that. So I decided to look into it a little further. The first person I looked at was Lucretius. He was a philosopher, a poet, a thinker, and also the first to combine the theory of atomism with the human body and soul. He was the first to speculate on the possibility of an invisible living world. Now, it took another 1,600 years until microbiology really took off with the invention of the microscope by, uh, not, by none other than Antony van Leeuwenhoek. He was not your traditional scientist either. He was a haberdasher, a designer of men's clothing, who just loved to grind up lenses and see what's underneath. What he happened to find was animalcules, or as we like to call them today, bacteria. Now, the most important person here is Dr. Kerry Mullis. Dr. Mullis um, came up with a um, Nobel Prize winning improvement of PCR, or polymerase chain reaction. This invention led to the exponential increase in, in uh, research done around the world. Now, as you can see from the picture, he's not your traditional scientist. Before his invention, he was known as a baker, an author, and a surfer. Now, what do all three of these discoverers have in common? No, it's not an LSD trip and a PhD from the, uh, molecular biology from the University of California, Berkeley. That was only Dr. Mullis. All three of these inventors were able to expand their fields, their interests, and see connections where others could not. They were innovators. They were able to extract information from even the tiniest of things. Kind of like a cell. I was able to learn that studying and your career is dynamic, that there's not one way to go about it, and that if I wanted to be successful, more than successful, if I want to be extraordinary, I'm going to have to be an innovator, and that I know that other people in the past have done it. It doesn't matter what you're going to do after you graduate. The question, what are you going to do after you graduate, is quite frankly very fruitless, because in reality, you have no idea where you're going to be one, five, or ten years from now. The more important question, and the question that you should be asking yourself every day is, what are you going to learn today? Thank you.